rejected and mistreated and couldn't find jobs and all kind of things terrible happened to them. And so there, I'm sure there were some peace-loving fools in the nation of Israel that, uh, and by the way, this is speculation, but I think it were true. Of course, their culture was different. They would have come back and said, David, you know, you just think you're a mighty, wonderful hero and you had no business. I mean, why did you have to chop his head off? Why did you have to cut off Goliath? You ever think about that? How many of you think that it's terrible that David went up to Goliath, took his own sword, whacked his head off and carried the thing around? You know, took it back to Saul. I mean, did he have to take his head off? I know he told him he would. He said, I'm gonna, this day I'm going to take your head, you know, to Goliath. I mean, did, did God's people have to take the head of the Philistine and carry it? See, you'd be critical of David too. You wouldn't like him bringing that thing in here and bragging about it. And so, um, you think about it, if you will. There are a lot of things that David did that could cause him to be unpopular. And I understand their culture was different than it is today. And it was probably a lot better that way. We don't have a lot of the foolish nonsense that says make friends of the people that are trying to kill you uh, in our society today. And that's another, that's a whole another, uh, a whole another topic or com of conversation. I just want to point it out to you in case your thinking's messed up on it. You know, and this is an aside as well. Brother Charlie and I were talking about taking notes and messages this week. I think it's important. I'm always glad to see folks show up with a pen and a, and a notebook. And I, one of the things I notice when I take notes on preaching is that when I go back to it, I'll, I'll be taking notes. I'll say, man, that's really good. That's really helpful. And I'll go back and I'll look at it again. And I think, well, that's good. But it doesn't seem like a real big deal to me. It doesn't, and, or I'll take a preaching tape. But, uh, I'll, I'll take a recording of a sermon that God really used in my life to make a decision. And I'll listen to it again. I'll say it's a good message and I recommend it for other people. But it just doesn't have the same impact on me it did when I first listened to it. You know why it is? Because the truth of the Word of God changed my mind. And it fixed something that was wrong in my way of thinking. And so when my way of thinking was corrected, it didn't need to be corrected anymore. And so I retained what I'd been taught. And so it didn't have the impact on me, not because it was untrue, but because my thinking had been conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and I've been bettered by it. And preaching does conform your thinking. I'm not, I think you should take notes, and you should put these things down. But sometimes your thinking will change about some things by the preaching of the Word of God. And my point is, that's why I mentioned the whole thing about chopping off Goliath's head. Maybe your thinking is a little messed up by, uh, you know, watching Whale Wars too much or something like that. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Let's uh, go ahead and we'll move on. You don't know what Whale Wars is, do you? I've never watched it, but I know who uh, the Greenpeace organization is as well as the fellow that is, what's his name, Watson, Paul Watson. Uh, boy, I'll tell you something. If anybody in our country ought to be hung up and had their head chopped off, it ought to be Paul Watson. And you can report that and put it on YouTube. He hates, he hates God, he hates God's people, and he worships whales. And as our country's following him, and now I heard that people watch his show on the Discovery Channel. Anyway, boy, I really got off there. Yeah, all right. Well, there's an opinion for you. You can scratch it if you like to. Let's move on. Paul, or the Bible says about, not Saul, not Paul, but the Bible says about David that he behaved himself wisely. Look at verse 15, if you will. When Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. Okay, now let me finish making my point about Judah and Israel following him in verse 5. David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, behaved, behaved himself wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war, and he was except in the sight of all the people, also in the sight of Saul's, Saul's servants. Okay, Now, there is a categorization of the individuals who were um, followers, if you will, or supporters of David. Verse 16 says the men of Israel and Judah loved him. Verse 5 says that uh, the people, all the people, including Saul's servants, loved David. You know what that means? That means David didn't do anything wrong. There wasn't anything about David's life that you could say, well, you know what, this guy's a self-promoter, he's a self-supporter, and he's trying to usurp King Saul. Here he is, he's been a servant of Saul, he's a servant of God, and he's very careful about how he does it, so much so that nobody finds a problem with him except for King Saul. Now, why would it be that Saul would find a problem with David? Well, our text tells us in verse 8, the, the uh, women, when David had come back from the battle, the women had uh, been in the streets and they had been yelling things and dancing and different kind of dancing than what our society does today. They were basically jumping up and down and rejoicing about the victory that God had given them, the freedom that they had from the Philistines. They weren't going to have to pay taxes anymore. They weren't going to have their daughters stolen from the Philistines. They're not going to be made servants and slaves of the Philistines. And the atrocities that the Philistines had committed against them would not be done. So there's great freedom. They're very happy about it. Much like Iraq, when you watch the videos, when our country went into Iraq and liberated that country, which is what happened when we went into Iraq. Boy, I'm speaking about a lot of things that... Uh, controversy <laughs> anyway but 
what happened to Iraqi? And if you talk to an Iraqi person, you know, you remember the lady that held up her thumb with the um, the the dyed ink on it or whatever, the purple ink or blue or whatever color it was because she'd voted for the first time. And the rejoicing that happened about people that had been liberated. That's the sort of thing that was happening in the streets here in Israel. They're dancing and they're singing, David or Saul has killed his thousands, a great compliment to King Saul, but David has killed his ten thousands and Saul heard it and displeased him. He was very wroth concerning David. Well, he got angry about it. Um, verse 9, the Bible says, Saul eyed David from that day and forward. And so David, uh, in the eyes of King Saul, in the eyes of everybody in the nation of Israel, David is eyed favorably. But in the eyes of, of the person to whom he considered himself to serve, King Saul, uh, Saul was displeased. Now I want to point out something to you, and this is the reason I believe, according to verse 10 of the Scripture, that Saul had an issue with David from then forward. It wasn't just that David was lifted up in a greater position than King Saul. I believe what happened in verse 10 is instrumental in the life of Saul, helps him to understand something that makes him hate David forever. Verse 10, It came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand at his other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I'll smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So here's the scenario. David has the responsibility when an evil spirit come on Saul and trouble him after, after God had stopped, had his spirit had really been removed from Saul. And the only time that God's spirit came on Saul was really to vex him and trouble him. And we find here, you know, many times I've wondered, well, is this an evil spirit like a, a satanic spirit that's coming on Saul or is it God? Well, the Bible says the evil spirit from the Lord. I don't believe God was sending a demon to torment Saul. I believe it was God himself coming to Saul and reminding him of his rebellion, reminding him of his bitterness, and reminding him of his re that he's been rejected. Saul was never allowed, uh, from the time that he rejected God, he was never allowed to have peace because he never repented of his rebellion. You, we, when we looked at King Saul, we looked at what should have happened when God rejected him as king. And the answer to it is this. If you'll study the scripture and you'll be careful about it, what Saul should have done when God said he was no longer qualified to be king of Israel, he should have said, well, God, who is the king? I'll serve him, and I'll serve you by serving him. That's all Saul had to do. All he had to do is say, well, God, if I don't have the right to be king, who gave Saul the right to be king? God did, and he knew that when he became king. And when God rejected him as king, all he had to do to get right with God, to be restored in his relationship with God, would be to take the crown off his head, symbolically I mean, take the sword off his belt, and say, God, where's the man whom you've anointed? Who is he? I'll serve him. And that man was David. Well, in verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 5, and I don't think that we're speculating too much. I think we're accurate about this when we look at it. There was an evil spirit from the Lord that came upon Saul, the Bible says, and he prophesied. Well, what is it when he prophesied? Well, when he prophesied, God revealed things to King Saul. And I believe the thing that was revealed to King Saul as David was in his presence was that, Saul, there's the man whom you should serve as king, David. Here is David playing soothing music for the purpose of bringing comfort to Saul and, and allowing him not to be troubled and and, uh, of course, we see in, in, through this the importance of appropriate music that helps us in our spirits and doesn't vex our spirits. And here's David, and he's playing some beautiful music, probably singing hymns and praises about the Lord as he did or sing psalms. Many of David's psalms are recorded in the book of Psalms. And here's David with this ministry serving Saul. And God says to Saul, uses him to prophesy, here's the king of Israel. And Saul's response is when he got control of himself, he grabbed a spear and tried to kill David. It's interesting that the rest of King Saul's life, after God rejected him as king, was not spent serving the nation of Israel, was not spent leading the nation of Israel. It was spent trying to eradicate the individual whom God called to be king. Uh, Christian, do I have to remind you that you cannot win in a battle against God and that you cannot kill the Lord's anointed? You cannot fight against God and win? By the way, then let me ask you a question. Whose side are you on? Are you serving the Lord? Can I submit to you by the same token that in the same way that David who behaved himself wisely and believed the Lord and served the Lord and had confidence in the Lord could not be killed by King Saul though he were in the very presence of the one who desired to kill him. So two times Saul tries to kill David. And we've seen Saul and I don't think that, it, that he just had bad aim. You know, he tried to kill David and, uh, or he tried to kill Jonathan. 
I believe the reason he couldn't kill Jonathan, I think Jonathan slapped the spear he threw at him aside and or, or yanked it away or something.